It's good to see uh, a lot of you guys back from last night. I know there's a couple new faces, uh, but it's good to have you. Welcome. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Ricky, for those who don't remember, um, and it's good to see you one more time. So uh, last night we kind of started this uh, thing called an apologetics conference here, um, where we've uh, tried to invite the community of Fargo to come and just and just hear uh, about these different uh, topics that we have going on this week. So last night we kind of heard from uh, uh, Dr. Paul Nelson, who's a teacher, an adjunct teacher over in Biola University, uh, about uh, hello, can you hear me still? Okay, perfect about orphan genes, right, and its relationship to evolution in comparison to intelligent design. Um, and then today, actually, we're kind of shifting gears, so we're not necessarily going down the evolution uh, uh, side, but rather we're coming at it from more phys philosophical side, which is uh, really interesting, I think. Uh, but basically, the theme for tonight is, have you found it? Uh, what is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life and is happiness really it? Are we just working towards happiness? Um, and so tonight, uh, before I start, I'd just like to introduce a speaker. Uh, her name is Brooke Litsky, and she's actually homegrown here in North Dakota. So if you're from North Dakota, been in North Dakota for a long time, uh, she is a product of here, which is really cool. Uh, she just graduated last year from the University of Jamestown for some of us who are affiliated with that school, uh, for some of us who went and graduated from the school also. Hello, KB. <laughs> well, she graduated last year uh, with her uh, man. You know, I'm not even going to try to attempt to say what she graduated with because it was like 18 things. Uh, but she got done in three years, which is super cool. Uh, but her main, uh, her main, hello, welcome in, welcome in. Uh, her main degree was found in religion and communications. Uh, which is really awesome. Um, and now she's working as a pastor for the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, here in the uh, Dakotas, North and South Dakota. So um, without further ado, I'd like for Pastor Brooke to come on up and, and we can begin. But first, we shall pray. Uh, yes, so if you could bow your heads with me, we'll pray. Uh, Father in heaven, ultimately, uh, we're here to try and figure this thing out um, and, and, and to see uh, exactly how you uh, pertain to me, to all of us. And so I just ask that uh, that for us, that you would be here, that you would pour out your spirit here, and that you would dwell with us, that you would be with us, and that you would show up mightily um, and, and impact us in an incredible way. Uh, so that maybe not today, uh, or, but I hope that today would be the day, um, man, that we just come and understand that you're absolutely real and you want us, you want us to be with you, uh, not just now, but forever. So Come speak. May your spirit be here with us. In your name I pray. Amen. Pastor Brooke, come on up. All right. Give her a, a warm welcome, please. Yeah. one instead of this one. Pigs. Sorry. Okay. How's that? Good? Great. Okay. So the question of why do I do what I do? Why do I get up in the morning? Is there a purpose to life? What is the purpose of life if there is one? Um, and I think that that you could probably ask 
anybody uh, this question and they would give you a different answer. You know, they, they would give you a different answer. Maybe they would tell you um, that the purpose of life is, uh, is to have children and have a family and, and have a successful career and to make lots of money. Uh, perhaps other people would tell you that the purpose of life is to be happy. Um, some people might tell you that the purpose of life is, well, that there isn't one, that, that we're really just here uh, to live and to die, and that's all. Um, <coughs> excuse me. A, a few years ago, actually quite a few years ago, back in the 1980s, 1988 to be specific, Time Magazine um, did a study where they went around uh, in New York City and, and they surveyed a selection of individuals and they asked them the question, what is the meaning of life? They, they surveyed theologians and scientists and pastors and authors and artists and celebrities and everyday people on the street. And they all gave these different answers to this question, all very interesting. Um, there was a composer named John Cage who said, there's no why, just here. Uh, there was uh, another man named Jose Martinez who was a taxi driver, and he said this. He said, we're here to die. Just live and die. I drive a cab. I do some fishing, take my girl out, pay taxes, do a little reading, then get ready to drop dead. You've got to be strong about it. Life is a big fake. Nobody gives a damn. Whether you're rich or poor, you're here, you're gone. You're like the wind, and after you're gone, people will come. We're going to destroy ourselves. Nothing we can do about it. The only cure for the world's illness is nuclear war. Wipe out everything and start over. Sounds pretty depressing to me. Um, and, and there's a plethora of other quotes. Uh, Charles Darwin, we are here because we evolved. Aristotle, happiness is the meaning and the purpose of life, the whole aim and existence, or whole aim and end of human existence. The Dalai Lama, the purpose of our lives is to be happy. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. H. L. Mencken, an author, um, you come into the world with nothing and the purpose of your life is to make something out of nothing. And E. D. Klumke, an objective meaning, that is one which is inherent within the universe or de dependent upon external agencies would frankly leave me cold. It would not be mine. I, for one, am glad that the universe has no meaning, for thereby is man all the more glorious. I willingly accept the fact that external meaning is non-existent, for this leaves me free to forge my own meaning. Is the meaning of life really happiness or death? Now I'm going to refer to, to this thing called it tonight. This thing that it, that's kind of arbitrary that I'm, that I'm going to call it tonight. Um, because no matter what you think your purpose is, and, and no matter how much stuff you have or don't have, or how happy you are or aren't, there's still something that drives you. There's still something that causes you to get up in the morning that you desire to live for. There's still something that brought you here tonight that you said, I think it sounds like a good idea to, to show up at the Ramada and to listen to this girl speak. Something that drives you to do life on a daily basis. So what is this it that you're still pursuing? And I have to ask you, how often is it that you consider the question of purpose? What is my purpose? What is the purpose of life? How often do you consider that question? Now for the average person, it's probably not that often. Um, the only time that, that you probably really think about this question of what is my purpose and what is the purpose of life is when something happens that shakes the foundations of what you have thought was your purpose all along. Perhaps you lose your job, you get laid off, you get fired, 
you get injured so you can't do your job anymore, you lose your job, and you wonder, well, what is my purpose? Perhaps you've been a, a stay-at-home mom for 20 years, and your kids grow up, and they move out of the house, and they go off to college, and they, they do other things, and you say, well, what is my purpose now? I don't have children to take care of anymore. What else am I good for? Perhaps your purpose is found in, in a relationship, and all of a sudden that relationship ends and it's gone, and you begin to wonder, what is my purpose? Now there's a few different ways that we react to, to this question of purpose that I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, one is that we think that obtaining something will bring happiness and meaning. And it's just around the corner. The next thing that I can get, if I just have this, then I'll be happy. The second, we get angry. We begin to blame everybody else and we blame barriers. Well, if it weren't for this, or if it weren't for that, or if it, it weren't for the fact that that I'm an immigrant, or if it weren't for the fact that I grew up in an impoverished home, or if it weren't for the fact that uh, I didn't speak this or that language, or all these different things, if it weren't for those things, then I'd have it. Number three, we get something, and it's not good enough. It, the, the glamour wears off after a while, so we get a new one. Now, I think we can all agree that we, we live in an age of instant gratification where anything that we want and anything that we desire is pretty much at the tips of our fingers. We can, we can have it all in an instant. And with that comes also uh, this, this idea and this attitude that these things are going to make us happy, but after a while that wears off, so then we'll just get a new one. I heard a story uh, not too long ago uh, about this uh, pastor who had a friend who all his life had, had just wanted a Porsche. That's a nice car. So he had wanted this Porsche for his whole life, and he became very wealthy. And, and so after a while, he ended up buying this Porsche, and it was like $150,000, right? And so, so he got this car and he picked up his pastor friend and he took him for a ride. And they're like, wow, this car is great. This is it. Isn't it awesome? Look at my Porsche. Well, about a month later, uh, this pastor was walking into the gym and he saw his friend's Porsche parked outside of the gym right in front there to show it off. So it looked really nice. Um, and as he was walking into the gym, he met his friend. And he said, hey, man, how, how's the Porsche? You know, and, and the guy replies to him and he said, well, it's a car. And isn't that ironic that something that we place so much significance on, something we place so much importance in, that we hang our hope on and we say, this is going to make me happy. This is all I've ever wanted. After a month, that feeling can be gone. That happiness that we felt at the beginning can be gone. And number four, we get to a point sometimes in life where we look back and we realize that we're not happy, that we're not fulfilled, and that we don't feel whole, that we worked our whole lives, that we spent our whole lives saying, well, if I just work a few more hours, if I just make a few more dollars, then I'll get to a place where I can be happy. Then I'll have this thing where I can be happy. Then I'll have this. And we look back and we realize that we've worked our whole lives to, only to get to a place where we actually haven't made it and that we aren't as happy as we thought that we were going to be. And we begin to blame ourselves and it turns into this spiral of defeat that for some people can actually turn into a place where they get, they get to a point of wanting to commit suicide because there's no hope in life for them anymore because they've wasted their whole lives, so to speak, seeking after something that they didn't get. Now, if you haven't noticed, the world around us tells us every day 
that the next thing is going to bring us happiness. There's an example. We have, on average, over 700 ads flashed at us every single day. 700 ads. That's mind-blowing. That's, that's an insane amount of advertisement flashed at us every single day, trying to tell us that we aren't happy because we don't have something or that we need something else. Especially uh, this time of year, uh, I'm sure you've seen on TV or if you watch TV or, or listen to the radio at all, um, there's all kinds of ads for Valentine's Day and they're all like, men, your woman isn't happy unless you get her this nice diamond ring or this nice necklace. So you should probably do that because you want to make her happy, right? All kinds of ads like that around this time of year. But if you think about it, there's ads similar to that, just with different focuses, being shot at us every single day. C.S. Lewis, who, who is a very famous author, um, he wrote a lot of religious uh, novels, but also a lot of fiction novels. Um, he spoke to this uh, this concept and he said there are all kinds of things that promise to deliver happiness but they never keep their promises just like the Porsche the enamor begins to wear off and it fades into reality and when he was talking about this he, he was talking about it in terms of, of the best possible things. He was saying, even if you have the best possible marriage, the best possible relationship, the best possible career and job, and you're completely happy in all of those things, you have the best of things, but somehow this it still manages to evade you. Now there's another author that I want uh, that I want to talk about here for a little bit. Um, his name was Tolstoy. Perhaps you've heard of him. He's a pretty famous guy. He he was a very wealthy man. He had an incredible reputation. He had written lots of novels and made tons of money. He had a great marriage um, with with children. Um, he had essentially he had everything. And at some point, um, as he he reached upwards of fifty, he became severely depressed. And he looked back on his life and he, and he saw uh, ahead of him, he saw, you know, his reputation expanding and growing, but he saw behind him all of the things that he had done for his entire life beginning to fade away. And he looked back and he said, why does it matter? Why does any of this matter? And he said this, he said, today or tomorrow, sickness, sickness and death will come and they had come already to those I love, or to me. Nothing will remain but stench and worms. Sooner or later my affairs, whatever they may be, will be forgotten, and I shall not exist. Everything I've ever done will be forgotten, and I won't be here anymore. Then why go on making any effort? How can man fail to see this, and how go on living? That is what is surprising. Only One can only live while one is intoxicated with life. As soon as one is sober, it is impossible not to see that it is all a mere fraud and a stupid fraud. That is precisely what it is, he said. There is nothing either amusing or witty about it. It is simply cruel and stupid. Had I simply understood that life had no meaning, I could have borne it quietly, knowing that that was my lot. But I could not satisfy myself with that. I couldn't satisfy myself knowing that life had no meaning. Had I been like a man living in a wood from which he knows there is no exit, I could have lived. But I was like one lost in a wood who, horrified at having lost his way, 
rushes about, wishing to find the road. He knows that each step he takes confuses him more and more, but still he cannot help rushing about. It was indeed terrible, and to rid myself of the terror, I wished to kill myself. I just talked about this a little bit ago. Some people get to a point, and they look back, and they say, I'm not happy, and I've worked my whole life for this, and now I'm to this point where I have no hope, and I want to kill myself. This was Tolstoy. My question, he says, was the simplest of questions, lying in the soul of every man, from the foolish child to the wisest elder, everyone's question. It was a question without an answer, to which one cannot live, as I had found by experience, and it was this. What will come of what I am doing today or shall do tomorrow? What will come of my whole life? Differently expressed, the question is, why should I live? Why wish for anything or do anything? It can also be expressed thus. Is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? Is there anything that I can do or create that death, which we all have to come to the point of, will not destroy. He was essentially saying, I have everything, and it isn't there. I'm still empty. Is there anything that the death awaiting me will not destroy? Now, a few years ago, uh, some of you may be familiar with this. A few years ago, this phrase became very, very popular amongst young people, uh, specifically in Western cultures. Um, and, and it's called YOLO, right? It stands for something. It stands for this. You only live once. YOLO, right? And this whole like YOLO movement came about a few years ago where, where young people became obsessed with this idea of I need to do everything I can to be happy in the moment because you only live once. So I need to do all of these things to experience the greatest, uh, the greatest maximal pleasure that I can now because I'm never going to get a chance to do it over. And while that can be taken in, in possibly some good ways, uh, most of the time, the way that that came to be was that young people became uh, obsessed with doing wild and crazy and destructive and harmful things for the sake of seeking pleasure in the moment. Um, you know, things like, like binge drinking, uh, parties, drugs, all these different things. Uh, this was a huge craze for a while where, where young people... Um, they said, YOLO, you only live once, so I might as well live it up while I can. I might as well enjoy as much of life as I can, whatever that looks like, whatever is going to please me at the moment, I'm going to do it because I only get to do it once. But what I think that this signifies more than, than possibly adolescent uh, idiocy it is really a search for happiness. It's a search for happiness. But can that really be it? Can this live for pleasure attitude be all that we have to look forward to? Because happiness tends to be circumstantial. It's based on, on the situations that are happening in your life at the moment. It's based on, on your attitude and your mood and the people that you're surrounded by and, and the circumstances that you're facing. Happiness is circumstantial. It changes. It, it's fleeting and temporal. If your meaning in life is what you come up with, then it does not matter. And I'll tell you why. Because if your meaning in life is something that you have created for yourself from inside of yourself, it is absolutely something that can be taken away at any given point. It can be taken away just like your circumstantial happiness. It can be taken away by situation, by environment, by unexpected circumstances. Thus, 
We must find a meaning that is external to ourselves. We look around us in the world and everything that we see has a purpose and a function. A pen. A pen is for writing. A chair. A chair is for sitting. A piece of paper is for writing. We look around us and everything that's created in the world has some kind of purpose. It was created, it was designed for a purpose. And it's hard to think that we as humans, uh, you know, the, the most advanced, the most developed organisms that, that walk the face of this planet aren't designed and created in the same type of manner where we have some kind of purpose, that we were, we were made for something. Now in the Greek language, in the ancient Greek language, there are two words for the word, word. Did you follow me? There are two words for the word, word. Rhema, the first one, means spoken word. It refers to conversation, to things that were said, to dialogue, to, to quotes, to statements, to things like that. That's what that word means. Logos, on the other hand, refers to reason, to logic. Perhaps you've heard this if you've ever taken a speech class. They tell you, you know, that there's the three pillars of speech and this is one of them, the logos. You have to have the logic. It's, it's the things behind what you're saying that cause it to make sense, that'll, that'll allow people to believe you, that, that allow them to reason through it and say, yes, I'm willing to buy into that because it makes sense. That's the reason behind it. I understand the purpose behind it, the reason, the purpose. Now, in the Christian Bible, there's a man named John who talks about this. He says this. The first, the first chapter of John, the first verse, he says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In this context, John doesn't use the word rhema in the Greek but he uses the word logos. So John says to the ancient Greek people, he says to them, in the beginning was the logos and the logos was with God and the logos was God. In the beginning was the reason, the purpose. And the reason and the purpose of life was with God and, and that reason was God. Now, at the time, this this was when uh, when when Greek philosophy was huge. All kinds of people were were coming up with different ideas about the meaning of life, uh, you know, and, and they were trying to to philosophize and and come up with all these different things and and just thought and and and, and philosophy was very popular at the time. Um, and so for John to say something like this, this is a very bold that he's uh, he's telling um, the Greek thinkers that he's speaking to. He's saying, hey, in the beginning was the reason of life, the purpose of life, and, and that reason and that purpose was with God. But, but further than that, it actually was God. And for them, uh, that was a very bold statement. And it might have sounded crazy and it might have sounded unbelievable, and it might have sounded illogical, and it might have sounded supernatural. But it also might have just blown Greek minds, because it's not something that they had ever thought of. And John, John might have said to them, you want to you know what the purpose of life is? Okay, I'll tell you. It's a person. 
goes on to say, He, the Word, was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And then finally, he says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And so he says, you want to know what the purpose of life is? I'll tell you, it's a person. And and to take it a step further, in this person was life. The meaning of it all was found in him. And so Greek thinkers might have said, well, even if you're right, it's not like we can know him or or understand this person that you're talking about, right? And and so then John he goes a step further and he says, the word, the logos, became flesh, put on humanity, became a human being, and made his dwelling among us. In the Greek, that literally means like that he pitched his tent among us. That he he was here to stay, he was camping out. He 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 made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. John goes further and says that the logos, the reason, the purpose of life became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, the reason that this is important is because, like I just said a little bit ago, for us to create a meaning from within ourselves is something that can be taken away. But for us to to accept and to embrace a a meaning that comes from without us, from outside of us, a a, a purpose that is external to us, that's a purpose that cannot be taken away from you because it comes from outside of you. It's something that's, that's not affected uh, by, by my flaws or your flaws or my actions or your actions. It, it's not something that is able to be taken away from us based on circumstance. Science only tells us the how. But I don't think that it tells us the why. I think that no matter no matter what your beliefs are on on evolution versus creation and, and things and, and and how we got to this point that, that we're at right now, um, that's not the debate for me. Uh, because even even if science may tell you the how, the how we got here, and even if we were to venture to say that, what if we did we did evolve from these different things? Okay, but that's only the how, but it's not the why. That still doesn't give me a purpose to wake up in the morning or anything to live for. It only tells me that I hear that I'm here to exist. Looking only through the lens of science, we still have no idea what the purpose of our existence really is. Like we said earlier, from the beginning of time, people have looked for for meaning. In college, one of of the things that I studied uh, was communications, and specifically cross-cultural communications. And so I studied uh, some things about ancient tribes where, where there were people groups who had no idea that any kind of outside world existed um, aside from themselves. They had, they had no idea that anything else was out there. They, they didn't have written language. They, they simply had um, vocal communication that they had developed within each other to be able to communicate. Um, and they lived and they dwelled together and they had communities um, and did all these different things. Um, but the crazy part about um, these ancient tribes is that even though they they had no idea that anything else was out there, they couldn't read, they couldn't write. They began to worship something. And and I don't know how how we can really explain that. How we can explain 
uh, that people who, who had no knowledge of anything other than the human beings that surrounded them and, and the environment and the animals that surrounded them, that they began to worship something. That they, that they looked to the sky and, and they, they raised their hands and they praised and, and they built altars and, and statues and all these different things trying to worship something because they knew that there was something external to themselves that gave them meaning, that something had to have put them there. And so they began to worship. And I think that, that the same is true of us today, of all of humanity, because everybody worships something. Whether you like it or not, you worship something. Whether you worship your job or your car or, or your, your spouse or your family, or you worship some kind of God, I believe that everybody worships something. Everybody has something uh, that they look to, um, that that they that they search for in times of need, that they that they cry out to in the midst of their pain, um, that that they uh, are excited about when when things go right. Because I believe that innately we know. We know that the value that we are trying to search for is not found in things. There was a king in the Christian Bible. His name was King Solomon. And he has an interesting story because, because the story goes like this. He was a king who, who had a lot of power, a lot of wealth. He, he had all these great things, right? And, and God told him in the story, God told him, whatever you want, I will give it to you. Like, ask for something. And what King Solomon asked for was not, was not money, was not fame, was not power, but he asked for wisdom. He asked for wisdom. And so he, he was granted that. And because he asked for wisdom, uh, God gave him, on top of that, all of these other things where he was also given power and wealth and fame and, and all of these things, and he was a great king, uh, the Bible says. And and he got to the end of his life, and he was also a man who, who like Tolstoy, had everything. He had the most fame, the most wealth, the most power, the most wisdom. And he got to the end of his life, and he said this. He said, "'Fear God and keep his commandments.'" I've had everything, he said. And that's what it's all about, is, is fearing God and keeping his commandments. I had it all, but yet I had nothing without God, w without him, without this external source of meaning that called me into existence. I had it all, but I had nothing without love itself, without God. You can search your whole life for it, for this it. But I believe, and, and I dare to say tonight, that this it is Jesus. It, it's, it's the word made flesh, the logos. And, and not just in some arbitrary sense where he's, he's far from us, but, but the logos, the reason, the purpose of life, that came to us, the Lagos came in order to reveal himself to you. And in the most powerful way, the Lagos, the purpose of life, Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. And I venture also to say that you'll never be truly satisfied until you link yourself with this logos, this reason, this meaning, this purpose of life. The word made flesh, Jesus. And some of you might be thinking, I don't know if I can buy into that. How can you, how can you venture to say uh, that Jesus is it? It could be something else if there really is a meaning and a purpose tonight. Uh, to life, but but I ask you tonight 
daring to say that you have nothing to lose by, by wondering. I ask you tonight, will you allow for the possibility that Jesus might really be it, that he might really be that thing that you've been searching for? Because it's possible that it could be. And I believe also that if you're willing to, to inquire of him and to, to, to cry out to him and to say, Jesus, if you really are it, if I really should believe in you, if you really are real, if you really have some, some kind of meaning and some kind of purpose for my existence, then why don't you show me? Because I absolutely believe that the God that I serve and the God that I believe in it is more than able and more than willing and, and more than happy and delighted and desiring to show himself to you. Because that's the reason that the word was made flesh was so that he might have a connection with you. He might have a relationship with you. He might show you that there is someone who cares for you in the universe, that you aren't here for no purpose. There's nothing to lose by, by wondering, by considering the possibility that Jesus might be the it that you've been searching for. And I don't know all of your situations. I don't know all of your backgrounds. I don't even know all of your names. But it's possible that I could be talking to somebody who has been searching for a lifetime for some kind of meaning, who, who has been trying to find a meaning and a purpose in various different things over the years. I could be talking to somebody who thought that they had it once upon a time, but something happened to change that and to cause you to doubt and to say that there's no way there's anything out there. I don't know all of your situations, all of your stories, but I believe in a God who does. And I believe that he is more than able to show you the love that he has for you if you're willing to ask him. So uh, with that, I'd like to pray. Um, if you're willing, please join me in prayer. God, I believe uh, that that there are people here tonight who need to know you because, quite frankly, we all need to know you. Jesus, you are the Word made flesh. You are the reason. You are the purpose. And somehow, 2,000 years ago, a bunch of people were willing to believe some guy when he said, that God had come to earth and he wanted to be with people and that he had created them and that he was the purpose of existence. For some reason, something was compelling enough, crazy enough, supernatural enough, that even though it sounded absurd, it was captivating and it was something that people were willing to listen to. God, I believe that you still have that kind of power, and so I pray uh, tonight, Jesus, that, that whoever needs to know you, whoever needs to come back to you, whoever needs to find their meaning and their purpose, that they may find it in you tonight, Jesus. I thank you for, for the opportunity uh, to be up here tonight. Um, and I ask for your blessing upon this room. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Hey, uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. If you have uh, specific questions, individualized questions that you'd love to talk uh, about, we're actually not going to have a Q&A right now, but we are going to have a three of us available after this, where if you have questions, comments, ideas, whatever, you, you're more than happy to come talk to myself, Brooke, or Pastor Casey, who's back there, who's waving his hand as well. Um, we're just kind of hanging out, and, and if you guys have any questions or, or remarks or anything that you'd like to talk about, please come up and, and speak with us. Um, and if not, it's totally okay, perfectly fine. Uh, but uh, two things. Tomorrow we're back on. Uh, tomorrow we're back on at seven o'clock. And I believe here in this room, right, Chris? Yeah, again? Okay, first. <laughs> They've been trying to change this all over the place. So here, again, seven o'clock. Um, and actually, before I end up finishing everything, we have a video to run about tomorrow night. Uh, so if you could actually roll that really quick to kind of introduce tomorrow night, that'd be perfect. So once said, every child is an artist. The trouble is remaining an artist when we grow up. In children, there's endless creativity and boundless imagination. And then somewhere along the line, someone told us, grow up, come to reality, stop living in this imaginary land. And our creativity was stifled as we settled into, into what society told us life was all about. But if I'm made in the image of this grand creator God, what am I doing living a life of mere existence? Where today is the same as tomorrow and the next day and the next day over and over and over. Belief in Jesus doesn't stifle our higher capacities, it rather unleashes them as we recapture imagination and creativity. It's not just belief in some, some person who, who is abstract and away from us. It's rather belief in wonder and amazement. Cool. So I hope that's good for you to welcome you back tomorrow. If you're interested, please come 7 o'clock tomorrow night here, same place. Bring friends, family, dogs, pets, fish, whatever. Bring them by. We'd love to have you. Um, so that's first things first. And I forgot the second thing. Oh, okay. There's more programs. Oh, I'm on screen. Hi. Hi, me. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm like a, I have something. What's it called? ADHD or something? Or like I see like a squirrel and like all of a sudden I'll focus on that. Anyway, uh, so I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, there's programs outside. And then there's also uh, these cards. So just in case, uh, there's a couple different options that you could check on the card. Uh, just in case you have more questions, you can fill it out and you can fill out your personal contact information so that we can keep in contact with you if you're curious to keep asking questions and continue dialogue. And there's much more options on there just for our sake to know how to uh, better relate with you and to have a more relationship with you. So those will be outside as well. Um, so yes, thank you so much for coming and we hope to see you guys tomorrow. Yeah, we're 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 done. Yep, we are we are finished. We are fini. Terminado. My name is Brooke Litsky, and I am uh, I'm a pastor in here in North and South Dakota. So, yeah. Anyways, thank you so much. Yeah, the next time we'll have like an open Q and A is Friday night. Okay, Friday night, uh, when we're gonna talk about hell. <laughs> Uh, and what that means for you. Uh, so yeah, come with questions. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have a good night, okay?